Now, tonight's talk is about the fighting of 1941, and I've called it High Noon for Hitler. And we're going to start our tale on the 12th of February, 1941, where we ended our, our tale last year. And we're going to take the story up to the 5th of December, 1941. So by the 12th of February, 1941, Germany had achieved a stunning and unlikely victory over France and now stood as master of Europe. Poland, Denmark, Norway, the Netherlands, Belgium, Luxembourg and France had all fallen. But the Luftwaffe had failed to win control of the skies over Britain. And although the Blitz was taking a terrible toll, the British had held out and were growing stronger. Italy had entered the war against the British, but they'd been humiliated by the British army in Libya. In Operation Compass, the Italians had suffered around 150,000 casualties for less than 2,000 British casualties and seemed on the verge of defeat in the Desert War. Their fleet had also suffered a heavy defeat at the hands of the Royal Navy, which had bombarded the city of Genoa which had mined the entrance to the main Italian port at La Spezia and had also launched a devastating port strike led by the British carriers on the Italian fleet at the port of Taranto. An effort to recover lost prestige by invading Greece had backfired spectacularly on the Italians and the Greek army was busy driving the Italians out of their colony in Abyssinia. As you'll be able to see now on the map, the southern half of Albania is already in Greek hands. Now Greece at this stage is at war with Italy, but not at war with Germany. It's important that we remember that. And you can see in grey the vast swathe of territory conquered by the Germans. Now the Germans were having some success against British convoys in the mid-Atlantic, but supplies were still reaching Britain. Germany's main aim now was to beat the British in the Mediterranean while attacking their convoys and bombing their cities. This failure, this critical failure to concentrate on the Atlantic by the Germans was a mistake. Already, British convoy losses were falling week, on, week in, week out, as ships and planes were released from anti-invasion duty. In the Atlantic, the British now had mustered 126 destroyers, including 50 town-class destroyers given to us by the Americans, their obsolete First World War equipment, but still in use. Do remember the towns, they'll come into our story later. There are also 89 corvettes, like the flower-class corvette. These are smaller than a destroyer, slower, but more manoeuvrable and cheaper to build. And there are also 39 sloops, like the Black Swan sloop, which are improved corvettes, all to deal, so some 200 warships to deal with the submarine menace. The old Coastal Command Anson bombers, of which, by the way, there is one of them in the Imperial Air Museum, if you want to go and see, they are beautiful things, but the old Coastal Command Ansons had already begun to be replaced by radar equipped US built Hudson bombers. This was pushing the U boats further and further west, away from the British coast, which meant that they had little operational fuel as they were having to operate further and further from Germany. Worse for the Germans, in February, the energetic British naval commander, Sir Percy Noble, was put in charge of the convoy war. Now, unlike many senior leaders that I've had to work with, he actually wants to see the action himself. And so he went to see himself to see what was happening. And then when he returned to land, he radically overhauled and improved the convoy system. Meanwhile, in Libya, Italy was desperately trying to fortify the capital of Libya, Tripoli. New Italian armies, hurriedly equipped with captured French weapons from 1940, and a new German army known as the DAC, the Africa Corps, led by Rommel, had started to arrive, but built up in Africa was slow due to a lack of ships and due to the, the attacks by the Royal Navy. Now Malta 
a British colony in the middle of the Mediterranean, a tiny island, an unsinkable aircraft carrier. Malta was a real problem for Germany and Italy. We have here on the screen in front of you the port of Valletta, guarded by a British light anti-aircraft gun. The British had turned it into an ideal air and submarine base. However, the British did have real problems in supplying the island with fuel and spares. Its removal was a high priority for the Axis. The British were already, though, in secret talks with the United States to discuss war plans against Germany, Italy, and the still neutral Japan. And so even though Japan and America are still neutral, the Americans are discussing already war plans with the British for our potential war with Japan. But they agree that the war against Germany will be given priority. And the Americans start to use their ships already, although a neutral nation, to guard our convoys in the Atlantic. The United States also managed to negotiate a crucial deal with the Norwegian government in exile to get vital bases in Greenland and Iceland. Even so, in February, 100 British merchant ships were sunk. And in March, another 139 British merchant ships were sunk. The German heavy cruiser, the Hipper, had launched a devastating raid into the Atlantic in February and escaped back to the Baltic before the Royal Navy could catch it. The German battle cruisers, the Scharnhorst and the Neisenau had already started to operate out of French base, the French base at Brest to raid into the Atlantic. But slowly, the British were building up forces in the Mediterranean. At any one time, the British had over 300 ships either on the way to the Mediterranean, bringing troops there, or coming back to get another load. But given the dangers of the Mediterranean route, they were having to go around South Africa to reach Egypt, to take the Cape route. The journey was slow, painfully slow. And so the build-up itself of British arms and equipment in the Mediterranean was slow and insufficient, given the vast needs of the British in the Mediterranean theatre. After all, there was fighting in Libya, there was fighting in East Africa, and there was already the potential of fighting in Greece. Now, Greece had refused British help in January. They, you might say why. They were afraid that if they accepted British help against the Italians, it would bring the Germans into war against them. And Greece was desperately keen to stay out of the German war. They were beating the Italians, after all. They didn't see any reason to anger either the Germans or the Bulgarians. Now, the British chief of the Imperial General Staff, Sir John Dill, was relieved because he believed that to save Greece from the Germans would take 20 divisions. Now, the British hoped to one day build an army of 55 divisions, but with our equipment abandoned at Dunkirk, there was nowhere, we had nowhere near 20 fully equipped divisions available and certainly couldn't take that sort of number to Greece. And so we believe that we didn't have enough troops to make that kind of difference. But in February, as our talk begins, the Greek government requested British troops and suggested that if we sent troops to Greece, then it would bring Turkey and Yugoslavia into the war against Germany. Churchill instantly ordered Dill to send four British divisions to Greece. But he tried to refuse. Dill pointed out that every single unit in the Middle Eastern theatre was already busy, many of them fighting already against the Italians in Libya, where they are, by the way, on the verge of victory in the desert. Churchill is furious with him. At that very moment, however, Rommel has arrived in Libya and he forces the Libyans to un the Italians, sorry, to unload his ships through the night. This is a shock to the Italians, as far as they're concerned, when it's dark, they're not working. War stops with the, uh, with the sunset. But Rommel is fighting a different kind of war, and he forces the Italians to unload those ships through the night, much to the disgust of the Italians. Now, Rommel's orders on arriving in the desert are simple. He is told simply to block the British advance. He is to defend the capital of Libya. He is not to attack the British. Our Foreign Secretary, Anthony Eden, 
should see him on the bottom right of the screen there, the particularly dapper man. We can see the people from left to right. We've got Rommel, commander of the DAC, the German African Corps. We got Sir John Dill, chief of the Imperial General Staff. We have General O'Connor, one of the best British generals of the Second World War, the man who had won Operation Compass with almost no British troops. Field Marshal Wavell, the commander of the Middle Eastern Theatre, and our Foreign Secretary, Anthony Eden. Anthony Eden is sent to have talks with the Greek government. Now, from the 15th to the 16th of February, he promises that Britain will send four divisions to help the Greeks, but only if the Greeks abandon the border, abandon northern Greece, and prepare to defend the shorter line of the Halicomon line. We say that if they don't abandon the north of their country, which we consider to be undefend undefendable, given the amount of troops available, then we won't help them. And they give us that assurance that they will pull their army back to the interior to try and defend Athens, roughly around Thermopylae, where the ancient Greeks had held for a time off the Persians. But given the short notice available to the British, and it is perilously short notice, all of these units are going to have to come from Libya where the British army is on the verge of winning the Africa war. Or they're going to have to be new arrivals into the area, like the Australians and the New Zealanders. Now, this is a real shame, because in East Africa, two British Indian divisions are fully equipped with mountain warfare equipment, and they would have been absolutely ideal for the Greek campaign. They are veteran units equipped for mountain warfare. However, they are deep into East Africa, fighting the Italians. Even if pulled out straight away, it would take weeks for them to get to the port and then more weeks to ship them to Greece. And so therefore, we're going to have to halt our drive in Libya, pull those troops out, evacuate, as it were, the drive into Libya to send troops to Greece. Wavell is dead against this. He says, win the war in Libya first, finish off the Germans and the Italians in North Africa, and then send troops to Greece. But he's personally overruled by Churchill. Well, he grumbled, but then he decides to gamble that Germany, German and Italian supplies in Tripoli are too low for the Germans and Italians to launch an offensive in Libya, especially as they only have a single road to the front. And so his prize general, General O'Connor, is withdrawn from Libya, and he's sent to Egypt to prepare for the mission to Greece. O'Connor is told to halt his troops at El Algela and then return to Egypt. On the 26th of February, in an effort to improve their supply situation, however, the Germans launch a massive air attack on the island of Malta. By the 1st of March, the airfields of Malta are unusable for British heavy bombers. The Luftwaffe to achieve this had only lost six planes. The British had lost five, but the British aircraft are having to come, obviously, from Britain, shipped around South Africa and then fly into Malta. They are very difficult to replace. By the on the 1st of March, Bulgaria declares war on Greece and Britain. On the 2nd of March, German troops cross the River Danube, heading for the Greek border. The best of the Greek army is deep in Albania, where they're already beating the Italians. But that does mean that the Greek border with Bulgaria is almost completely open, almost completely undefended. And the Bulgarian and German armies are steaming towards that undefended border. It's known as the Papagos Line. Now, that is modelled upon the Maginot Line. Now, for those of you who joined me for the 1940 talk, you will know that the Maginot Line actually stopped on it quite sensible, that although the Germans did manage to circumnavigate it, it's not a problem or failure of the Maginot Line designs. I'm fairly sure Aberdeen Museum recorded the 1940 talk. If you want to load it up, please do so. It will help their traffic through the, the, the museum website. Now, the Papagos Line, however, did stop dead at the Yugoslav border, and the Germans simply go round. The reason why it did that was Greece and Yugoslavia were very, on friend, very friendly terms, but that meant the Greeks did know that the Yugoslavs weren't going to defend that area so they really should have carried on building the Papagos line. Nonetheless, the Germans steam towards that Papagos line that is now left pretty much undefended. But remember, the British had got the Greeks to promise to abandon that defensive line and defend the internal line, the Halicomon line. 
However, when it comes to it, the Greeks refuse. The Greeks say they are on the verge of beating the Italians in Albania. They refuse to pull their troops out of Albania. Eden is absolutely furious by this decision. He can see that the Greek army is going to be trapped in Albania and destroyed. And he considers abandoning the Greeks and not sending British troops after all, fearful of another Norway. But, however, he is afraid that if we back down now, it might have an adverse impact on our relations with other countries in the Middle East. And so the British decision to fight in Greece is entirely political, not military. But there is some good news. On the 7th of March, the German U-boat ace Prien of U-47, the man who had sank, if you saw last year's talk, the British battleship the Royal Oak, was killed in the Atlantic. On the 17th of March, U-99, the single most successful U-boat the Germans had of the war, was sunk and its captain captured, along with a, another U-boat sank at the same time. Also, the Americans had just passed the Lendlease Act on the 1st of March, with the US agreeing to repair British warships. They also agreed to build the British escort carrier and also to lend the British more sloops. The key battle was the one in the Atlantic, and that was being won by the British. But in the rather less important theatre of the Mediterranean, the news for the British was about to get an awful lot worse. On the 21st of March, the Australian 6th Division arrives in Greece, having been pulled out of the fighting in Libya. On the 24th of March, Rommel disobeyed direct orders and launched a limited offensive in Libya. Remember, the British General O'Connor has already been pulled out of Libya. The best of the British troops, including all their tanks, have been pulled out of Libya. The troops that are left there are second line troops. Now, I'm a Nottingham lad. I, come, I live in Nottingham. I'm a historical advisor for BBC Radio Knox. I am proud of our Nottinghamshire regiments. One of the regiments left in Libya, however, were the Sherwood, the Sherman Yeomanry. They had been sent out to Palestine with horses, lances, and swords. They had then been sent to Libya and told to get rid of the horses, lances, and swords, and had been given artillery pieces. Most of them had never seen an artillery piece in their lives, so were given a written manual on how to use artillery. They'd only been given it a few days before the launch of Rommel's offensive. They would turn out to be fine soldiers. But at this stage in the war, they have not a clue what they're doing. And they're about to face the German Africa Corps in the deserts. The weakened British army has no choice but to fall back before Rommel. On the 25th of March, things get worse. Yugoslavia joins the war on Germany's side. But two days later, there's a coup against the Yugoslav government launched by the Yugoslav Air Force. They overthrow the Yugoslav government, get Yugoslavia to pull out of the war against Britain and to declare war on Nazi Germany. Churchill is delighted. Yugoslavia has an army of just over one million men, but it is badly equipped and badly caught out of position. On the 30th of March, however, Hitler, with growing problems in the Balkans, particularly with the Yugoslavs, Hitler decides to, to delay his invasion of the USSR, his invasion of Russia. And on the 26th of March, the Italian fleet, led by the modern battleship Vittorio Veneto, put to sea to attack British ships carrying British soldiers to Greece. Then the Vittorio Veneto is one of the best designed battleships of the Mediterranean. This design was also sold to Russia and to Spain. It is a beautiful design of battleship. Highly modern, designed in 1936. The most modern British battleship in the Mediterranean, bearing in mind the British have to worry about guarding the Atlantic, we have to guard the Mediterranean, we have to worry about Japan. The most modern battleship we had was of First World War vintage. This is 20 years more advanced than anything that the British have at this stage in the Mediterranean. And it is a beautifully designed warship. It sails out with the rest of the Italian Grand Fleet to attack these British ships. The British know it's been put to sea because we've broken their codes. So from Enigma Decrypts, the head of the, the commander of the British Mediterranean fleet, Cunningham, knows they've put to sea. But he's been told that under no circumstances are the Germans and Italians to be made aware that we have broken their codes. So he orders 
reconnaissance planes from Malta to fly into the area of sea that he happens to know the Italian ships are so that they can spot them and find them. And the Germans and Italians will think that we know they've put to sea because of the reconnaissance flights. Now, the pilots who did this had no idea that we knew there were Italian ships there. And they showed extraordinary bravery. Flying obsolete biplanes, to their surprise, they spotted a large Italian fleet to sea. And they flew incredibly low over that fleet again and again, getting shot at near point blank range the entire time, flying so close they could read the names on the side of the ships and come and land with that information. Little did they know the British already knew what ships were there and where they were going, but they showed extraordinary heroism to get that information back. And so the British Mediterranean fleet put to sea, led by the British battleship Warspite and the aircraft carrier Formidable to clash with the Italian fleet. The plan that, that Cunningham had was that he was going to lead with some cruisers, some, some medium-sized, fast-moving vessels that would then engage the Italians and then run away from the Italians. The Italians would chase and bring the Italian warships onto the guns of the British battleships that would be lined up ready to hammer the Italian fleet. Now this beautifully designed Italian battleship engaged the British cruisers and fired 94 times. And in an amazing display of gunnery, managed to miss with every single one of those 94 shots at the British fleet. It then ran slap bang into the British battleships and carrier and attempted to escape. The British tried to pursue, but the Italian ships are more modern and can move quicker. The carrier launched a series of obsolete swordfish biplanes that launched almost suicidally brave attacks on the Italian fleet. And they succeeded in doing enough damage to the escaping Italians to slow them. And Cunningham continued to chase them. And he caught up with them at night. Now, he caught up with them at a place called Matapa, the Battle of Matapa. And for those of you who like your pub quiz, your pub quiz trivia, uh, Prince Philip was actually on board one of these ships and he took part in the Battle of Matapan. Prince Philip was a searchlight operator. His job at the Battle of Matapan, which was a night attack, was to sign searchlights onto the Italian ships. That is an incredibly dangerous job because the problem with shining searchlights at night is that you are next to a dirty great big light source and every enemy gun is going to point at you. But he apparently had a time of his life. Now, Cunningham's officers advise him not to attack. They say, look, the Italians have better ships. There's more of them. It's at night. This is inherently risky. We've driven them off. Let's just accept that. But Cunningham was a fighting admiral. And he said that that advice was lily-livered, yellow-bellied. And he also said, remember, the Italians run. We chase. The British pressed home their attack at the Battle of Mazapan. And the Italians lost three heavy cruisers and two destroyers, and the Vittorio Veneto was crippled, with almost no loss to the British, who managed, who managed that difficult task of sustained, accurate nighttime shooting. But although the Italian battleship escaped, it had still been a heavy defeat and a humiliation to the Italian fleet. With the invasion of Russia, Operation Barbarossa delayed, Hitler ordered the invasion of Yugoslavia by the German Second Army, the Italians, and the Hungarian Third Army on the 6th of April. This would be one of many crises for the British. On the 1st of April, Rashid Ali Agayayna, a Palestinian Arab leader who had launched a failed anti-British revolt in Palestine, overthrew the pro-British government in Iraq. Now, Iraq had been given independence from the British in 1932, but it was a strange sort of independence. Britain gave Iraq independence in 32, but kept control of the ports, the army, the railways, the air bases, the radio stations, the television, foreign affairs, the economy, and the oil fields. So although Iraq was technically independent, the Iraqis did not particularly see it that way. And they decide that it's, with the Germans seemingly on the verge of victory in the Second World War, it's about time they threw off the shackles of British rule and changed sides. But with British troops already fighting in East Africa, Libya, and now Greece, there are no spare British troops to send to deal with this crisis. In Libya, Rommel's told to halt by the Italian General Garibaldi, 
but he refuses. He's then told to halt by Hitler himself. And again, Rommel refused to obey these orders, as he's realized he's unhinged the British defenses in Libya, as the 13th Corps of General O'Connor had been replaced by the static army of General Neen, as troops, more and more British troops and tanks, are sent to Greece. O'Connor's elite 7th Armoured Division had also been withdrawn to Egypt, pending shipment to Greece. Rommel decided to copy the tactics of General O'Connor from the year before, to send one column sweeping along the coast, while another column struck across the desert to encircle enemy forces. Starting from the left, Al Algaila is where the British had halted, by the 4th of April, however, Benghazi, in the hook of Libya, had already fallen. In Yugoslavia, by the 6th of April, three large mechanized columns of German troops had entered Yugoslavia, aiming for Belgrade, while another headed for Zagreb. A fifth column entered Yugoslavia in the south and entered Greece, outflanking the Greek border defenses as, as the border had been left unfortified. The Yugoslav Air Force was largely destroyed in 20 minutes, mostly on the ground, only for the loss of two German aircraft. The Yugoslav army is large with their one million men, but it's strung out on a 2,000 mile border and is short of modern equipment. It crumbled within days. In the desert on the 7th of April, Denner fell, and Rommel decided to start to capture large quantities of British supplies. General O'Connor is then sent back from Egypt to Libya. He's recalled, they say, for God's sake, would you try and please save us in Libya, rescue the situation. He dives into an aircraft to Egypt and flies straight for Libya to meet with General Neem, who's in control of the Libyan front. He lands, he meets with Neem, and then sees a armored car headed his way. He thinks it's a British armored car and waves, and waves it as it comes across. To his horror, he then realizes that it's a German armored car and General O'Connor and General Neem are both captured by a German reconnaissance unit just after O'Connor has arrived back in Libya. Wavell is absolutely distraught at the loss of his best general and asks London to offer to return six Italian generals if they would just give us General O'Connor back, but London refused to make the offer. A few days later, General Parry of the 2nd Armoured Division was also captured. The British now only had two generals left in Egypt. They had lost three out of five, including easily their best. Australian troops started to fall back to the key port of Tobruk and were soon surrounded in the city, trapped there, holding the port, as Bardia on the Egyptian border fell, and Rommel pushes right up to the Egyptian border. With equipment short in the fighting for Tobruk, the pictures, by the way, make really strange viewing, as the British equipment's mostly been destroyed, so the British are using captured Italian equipment. The German equipment's been mostly destroyed, so they steal equipment off the Italians, and the Italians are obviously using whatever Italian equipment's not been stolen by the British or Germans, which means that of the three armies, the Italians have the worst equipment, even though all three sides are using Italian equipment. And so identification in a photo is rather difficult. But in two weeks, Rommel had advanced 600 miles, and you might think the Germans would be delighted, but they're really not. Now, Holder, the head of the German army, is absolutely furious with him. Now, you might say, why? It's because he believes Rommel is frittering away elite and rare German panzer troops on the verge of the invasion of Russia to capture worthless desert. This 600 miles is a collection of sand dunes. The British really don't care but about the sand dunes. They simply had scuttled back before him. British losses in the desert had been light as they'd retreated before the Germans, unlike when O'Connor had destroyed the Italian tent farm. The only real loss the British had suffered had been O'Connor himself. But supporting the German advance, the advance of Rommel, had taken planes, trucks, fuel and troops, and especially planes away from the attack on Malta. And British submarines and planes were now using Malta to attack Italian convoys from the island once again. Holder is also really concerned about the loss of German trucks in the desert, which he desperately needs for the invasion of Russia. So he tells his deputy, von Paulus, to halt the plan for the invasion of Russia, to fly to Libya, to speak to Rommel, and to tell him, for the love of God, would he stop advancing across this worthless desert? 
Meanwhile, in the skies over Northern Europe, Germany had started to concentrate on bombing British ports, especially the port of Liverpool. Now, from the 19th of February to the second week of May, there were 61 major German bombing raids on British cities. 46 of these were against British ports. On the 12th of March, as you can see from the pictures, is the Liverpool Blitz. 316 German bombers attacked for six hours and leave 500 dead. They return the next day, but the strength of the Luftwaffe was slowly being drained away by these actions. From, the, from August 1940 to March 1941, the Germans had lost 3,132 aircraft in the skies over Britain. And that included 8,000 pilots and trained air crew, all of which would be badly needed for the invasion of Russia. Yet German pilot training remained low. As fighting raged in Libya and Yugoslavia, and in skies over Britain, on the 12th of April, Germany invaded Greece. By sheer bad luck for the British, a Ju-88 pilot disobeyed direct orders and put bombs on his aircraft as he flew over the Greek port of Piraeus. Now, I know what you're saying. Why was he told not to put bombs on that? His senior officer believed that the extra weight of the bombs would have meant that he couldn't get to Piraeus Harbour, which had a photograph, and come back. However, the pilot knew that he could. As long as he only carried two light bombs, he could still get to Piraeus, drop the bombs, take the photographs that were needed, and come back. And these are the photographs he took just after he dropped his bombs. These two light bombs, due to spectacular bad luck for the British, or spectacular good luck for the Germans, hit the transport ship Clan Fraser. The Clan Fraser had not yet been unloaded in Piraeus Harbour, and it was carrying 350 tonnes of high explosives to be given to the British troops in Greece and the Greek army. The explosion was so big, it destroyed 10 other ships in the port and broke windows in Athens seven miles away. The port was wrecked and disastrously, the port of Piraeus was the only port that could have been used to supply the British army in Greece. For the British, the fighting in Greece is already over. We've landed troops, but we have now absolutely no way of keeping them supplied, as the only port we could use has been blown up with the explosion of Clan Fraser in this rather, rather unlucky turn of fate. Now, for those again who like pub quiz trivia, one of the British pilots trying to defend this port had actually been the author Roald Dahl before his mental breakdown. After his mental breakdown, he actually was then employed as a spy on the Americans. And the books he wrote, the children's book Roald Dahl wrote, was actually his cover for him spying on the Americans. It's amazing what a cover story can do for your long-term career. But nonetheless, Pyrrhus is destroyed. Now, both sides have been sucked into a war that they did not want to fight in Greece. But critically, the Germans were busy preparing to invade Russia, whereas the British really didn't have any other active front. Now, in Greece, the Germans have outflanked the German defences trapping 60,000 Greek troops in Albania and around Thessalonica by the 12th of April. Now, the second Greek line is formidable, but badly manned, with most of the Greek army trapped in Albania. The British sent 80 aircraft to help, mostly obsolete Blenins and a few Hurricane, to fight against, however, 1,000 German aircraft and 390 planes. You can see why Roald Dahl quickly became a fighter ace, as these 80 British aircraft are fighting 1,400 Axis aircraft. The Germans tried to drive south to finish cutting off the Greek army and Albania, but they're halted by stubborn British and New Zealand infantry fighting around Mount Olympus before the British start to fall back on the Thermopylae position, reaching there on the 17th of April. British artillery in particular was particularly impressive at slowing the German arms. However, the Greek Northern Army is trapped and soon surrendered. At this point, the Greek army begs the British to leave Greece. I know what you're thinking, why would they do so? The Greek government realized that Greece was doomed. They also realized that if Greece was to have a future, the British had to win the war. And for the British to win the war, the British army had to be saved from the disaster that was the Greek campaign. The British start to head towards another set of beaches. On the 27th of April, German troops take Athens. 
that by the 1st of May, the Royal Navy has managed to pick the British Army up off the beaches and they dump them on the nearby island of Crete. The British had lost 12,000 casualties, but also 8,000 trucks and ultimately 209 planes. But the army had been saved. But once again, it had left its weapons on the beaches of Europe. Greece had been a blow to the British, but Barbarossa, the invasion of Russia, has been delayed by three crucial weeks and also caused the Germans a massive logistical headache just before the invasion. And the British had honored their treaty obligations to Greece. In East Africa, the British are driving the Italians before them. On the 2nd of May, the, the dispossessed Emperor of Abyssinia, Haile Selassie, re-entered Abyssinia. Asawa, capital of Italian Arishia, fell to the British the same day. And by the end of May, as you can see here, the British 11th African Division had entered Addis Abdaba, the capital of what is now Ethiopia, capturing 8,000 Italians. By the 20th of May, the Italians, except for a tiny force around Assab, surrendered to the British. And the British had to rush to save the Italian army from being massacred by the, uh, the African civilians. When the Italians had conquered this area, they'd used poison gas against unarmed civilians. And the African people remembered that fact. And so as soon as the Italians surrendered, attempted to massacre them. And so the British soldiers had to race to save their former opponents. Now, this campaign in East Africa cost Italy 250,000 men the same scale of loss as the Germans would lose at Stalingrad. It really is a massive defeat, but you won't find any films about it because the battle happened before America entered the war. So as far as therefore the films are concerned, irrelevant. But the Italians lose a quarter of a million men in this action and also 400 aircraft. It is a huge loss. And now the British Indian and African armies are free to go elsewhere. But fighting on the Greek and Abyssinian front continued. But while it was going on, British troops were also in peril in Iraq, where, if you remember, the pro-British government's been overthrown. When the coup began, Churchill asked Wavell, a CNC of Middle East, and Orkinlek, CNC India, to send troops, as the oil and the port of Basra were highly important to the British war effort. However, Wavell pointed out that he'd already stripped his army out of Libya to send them to Greece and he had no more troops to spare. So Orkinlek sent the 10th Indian Division, but Churchill is furious at Wavell for not sending troops. Iraqi troops tried to seize, as you can see here, tried to seize the key airfield of Habin Aya, but it was held by aircrew, obsolete trainer aircraft fitted with bomb racks, British civilians and Iraqi volunteers. More troops were soon airlifted in from India. By the 6th of May, Iraqi forces were driven from the airfield and Wavell was forced to cobble together Hab Force, a mechanised infantry force, including Arab volunteers led by a British officer called Glubb, Major General Glubb. Now, Major General Glubb will have an interesting career. He will stay in the Arab armies after independence and he will lead the Arab Legion in the first Israeli-Arab war and will be the best performing general in the, on the Arab side in that war. And so this is the start of his rather glorious but tragically forgotten career, as he leads Hab Force striking across the desert to reconquer Iraq for the British. The Germans sent aircraft to help the Iraqis, but due to a tragic mistake, the Iraqi rebels shot down the German aircraft coming to help them, thinking that they were British aircraft, including killing von Blomberg, the son of a German field marshal the Germans would understandably send them no more help after that. On the 19th of May, Malaysia, just before Baghdad, fell to the advancing 10th Indian Division, supported by the RAF, while Hab Force had finished crossing the desert. And by the 31st of May, the fighting in Iraq was over, and Iraq was reoccupied by the British Empire. In Libya, Rommel fails to break into the brook. His forces were needing 50,000 tonnes of supplies every month, and with Tobruk in British hands, it had to come by road from Tripoli, which was a 1,000 mile road journey. And of course, that road journey itself required petrol. The trucks taking petrol to Rommel's tanks burnt petrol traveling along that 1,000 mile road and then burnt more petrol traveling the 1,000 miles back. It's hugely wasteful for the Germans. 
and it's draining resources that the Germans need elsewhere, all the while being bombed by British aircraft and attacked by British commandos. Von Paulus is once again sent out to tell Rommel, for the love of God, stop capturing sand dunes. But he's disgusted to find out that he needs to send Rommel even more troops and more trucks on the verge of a Russian invasion. On the 15th to 16th of May, the British launch Operation Brevity. Led by General Strafer Gott, they try to push the Germans back from Tobruk and to clear the high ground around Solon. The attack fails, but casualties are low on both sides. Around 200 British casualties, around 600 German casualties. So a slight tactical success for the British, although they failed to advance. But with the British busy elsewhere across the Middle East, there really is little else that they can do. They can't launch any major attack to try and clear the Germans from Tobruk. But with Greece fallen and Libya locked into stalemate, Hitler asks his generals where he should go next. Should he invade Crete or should he invade Malta? His generals say, for the love of God, neither. However, he's determined to invade one of them. His generals beg him, neither concentrate on the invasion of Russia. Now, of the two, Crete, however, has almost no significance. Malta, at least, is highly important. But the Italians tell Hitler that Malta would be a tough nut to crack. And the Luftwaffe wanted Crete as a springboard for, to launch a paradrop invasion of Syria or Egypt, where German agents are already starting to scout out the oil fields. Hitler is also worried that British bombers might base on Crete to bomb the Ploesti oil field in Romania that supplies some 90% of all the German oil. And this is absolute madness. There's no way the British could supply that kind of air base on Crete, and also the skies above Ploesti are the best defended skies in the world at this time. There's no way we could punt some bombers over them. However, Hitler is paranoid about Ploesti. Uh, when he asks which he should go for, his generals say neither, but they do say that if you're to go for one, then please, for the love of God, invade Malta. So Hitler decides to invade Crete. Operation Mercury is on. German paratroopers would land and seize the airfields, and then they would land on these airfields elite Alpine troops brought in by air transports. And by the 20th of May, the invasion is ready. It would take 500 precious transport aircraft, the JU-52s, and 780 other planes. Now, JU-52 numbers are desperately short. They haven't recovered from their losses on the 10th of May, 1940, which you'll remember if you join me for last year's talk. And they can be badly needed to transport supplies in Russia, especially as the invasion of Russia is due to begin on the 21st of June, only one month away. So what have the British got to defend Crete? Well, they've got no planes, no radios, because they left them on the beaches of Greece, few anti-aircraft guns left in Greece, but they do have 32,000 Commonwealth troops with very few weapons and 10,000 Greek troops with very few weapons, because they're all left on Greek beaches. They're all short of equipment and ammunition. The defenders are led by the New Zealand general you see on the left, General Freyberg. He's highly honorable and incredibly brave. He'd won a Victoria Cross in the First World War, but even he said that he wasn't very bright and he didn't really understand aircraft. He'd actually retired in 1934 and only returned to active service because he was begged to do so by Churchill. Now, he was told by Ultra that the Germans were going to invade and the day they were going to invade. And he was also told that they were going to try and capture the airfields. But he knew he had to try and keep our breaking of their code secret. So to not give the game away, he decided not to defend the airfields that he knew the Germans were going to come to try and capture. That is a huge mistake. The landings start badly, however, for the Germans. Some of them are dropped out to sea and drowned. Others are impaled on bamboo, a horrible, horrible way to die. An armed Crete police unit beat off, beat off an effort to seize the town of Refno, while other landings are beaten off by Australian troops. Around Heraklion, an anti-aircraft unit takes a terrible toll on German air transports, and swift British counterattacks strike the German landing zones. Some German paratroopers try to storm the medieval walls of a town with storming ladders, and actually succeed in breaking into the town before running out of ammunition, where they start to get killed by civilians wielding spades. 
because it turns out the machine gun without bullets is less effective than a spade at beating a man to death, and they're forced to flee the town. The German landings have been a costly failure. But with German paratroopers all over the island, the situation is highly confused, especially in the New Zealand sector. The, New the 22nd New Zealand Brigade hold the vital Malin airfield, and they also hold Hill 107 protecting it. Now they had badly mauled the German paratroopers attacking them, helped by Creek civilians. None of the German objectives have been captured. Of the 14,000 paratroopers, nearly 2,000 are dead and 2,500 are already wounded. However, they have captured Creek prison. Critically, however, these New Zealand troops defending Malin airfield have lost the commu their communications as the telephone wires have been cut. Their commander, Lieutenant Colonel Ander, believed the rest of the Commonwealth forces had been destroyed and that his unit was the only one surviving in the area. And so he decides to pull back off the airfield, abandoning the critical airfields completely undefended. But at this moment, the Germans simply don't know that. Even so, by the end of day two, General Student of the, the paratroopers was under huge pressure to cancel the attack. He was told that if the German Alpine units couldn't land the next day, the battle was over. He ordered his staff officer to borrow his personal plane to fly to Malin airfield. This officer took a risk and tried to land on the airfield that the Germans believed was still held by the New Zealanders and found to his surprise, the airfield completely undefended and the Western side completely usable. The last of the paratroopers are ordered to be dropped on the lean airfield to the east and west of the airfield. Now the eastern drop lands straight on a Maori unit. The Maori unit is well equipped with knives and guns and they massacre those paratroopers. But the western drop is uncontested and they seize Malim airfield. After that, JU-52s start to land in German elite Alpine troops. A British counterattack is organized but against the well-equipped Alpine troops, it's soon beaten off. Elsewhere on the island, the German paratroopers are being massacred, but Crete by now was doomed. After being so close to victory, the defeat at Crete is inexcusable. On the 23rd of May, Freiburg starts to pull back to a new defensive line. The RAF bombs Malin airfield, destroying another 24 JU-52s, but it's too little, too late. On the 27th of May, the evacuation of Crete is ordered. Now, the Mediterranean fleet under Cunningham is not happy. Cunningham's forces have been busy. They've only just rescued the British Army from Greece, and now they've got to rescue them again. They're absolutely exhausted, especially as they've only just won a major sea battle against the Vittoria Veneto. And then after that, actually, the Germans have tried to land troops by ship on Crete. If you've ever seen little Greek sailing ships, beautiful white sailing ships, you might see them things like Mamma Mia. Well, the Germans tried to use some of those to land troops on Cretan beaches. The Royal Navy intercepted them and sank the lot, drowning hundreds of German sailors. But German aircraft had taken a terrible toll on the British ships doing it, sinking two light cruisers and four destroyers, and damaging two British battleships and another two light cruisers. Cunningham simply couldn't afford these losses. And yet now he was being told to rescue the army yet again. Although he's reluctant, he decides he must rescue the army. As he himself says to his officers, it takes seven years to build a warship. It takes 400 years to build a reputation. We will not let the army down. They, in an incredibly daring operation, they lifted off the British troops right under the noses of the Germans. With just a few fighters and a few radios, Crete could have been saved. But even so, the Commonwealth only lost around 3,500 casualties. The German losses were far worse, around 6,000 elite paratroopers dead and 151 irreplaceable JU-52s destroyed. Another 205 damaged, another 50 fighters and bombers lost, all just before the invasion of Russia. All of these units had been earmarked for key parts of the invasion of Russia, but now they have been destroyed. At sea, things continue to worsen for Germany. 200 US aircraft are now operating out of Iceland, hunting for submarines. And on the 9th of May, the, the, sorry, the German submarine U-boat ace, Lemp, is killed. Worse, the captain of the British destroyer Bulldog boards the U-110 
and takes their code book on Enigma machine. And the Americans made a film saying it was them that did it. It's the warship, the Bulldog, and a British destroyer and crew that capture the Enigma machine. And this really helps our decoding. Now, as early as August 1940, Bletchley Park had worked out all eight levers of the Enigma machine. Five had come from Poland in 1939. Levers six and seven had been captured from the U-33. The eighth had been captured in August 1940. But even so, we were only able to break about 10% of German traffic. A commander raid in Norway proclaimed more data, as did a raid on a German weather ship. But the UB-40 raid was an Aladdin's king of data. Now, by the 20th of May 1941, the Canadian escort force had finally closed the final unescorted convoy gap in the Atlantic with its navy, which now had 80 corvettes. For the first time, British convoys could be co escorted all the way across the Atlantic. The Canadians would take them halfway, what was called the map, the Mid-Atlantic meeting point. They would be met there by British warships that would take them the rest of the way. The Canadian warships would then sail to Iceland, refuel, go back to the map. The British warships would refill in Britain, take the convoy back to the map, and the Canadians would then take them home. An incredibly efficient system. And it's the Atlantic that is the key battle of the war. At any one time, the British have 2,000 ships at sea. The British could afford to lose Greece. Come to it, we could afford to lose Egypt, but we could not afford to lose the Battle of the Atlantic. Now, I know some of you, your, your bladders or kettles might be calling, but we will pause at eight, I promise you. Now, in May, the German battleship Bismarck and the heavy cruiser Prince Eugen entered the Atlantic. The battle cruiser Eisenau had already been bombed by the RAF at Brest. On the 24th of May, the British battleship Prince of Wales, still under construction with construction crews on board, and the battle cruiser Hood attempted to intercept the German warships. A lucky shot hit the Hood's mag magazine, causing it to explode. A major refit to solve this problem had been planned for 1939 a planned upgrade to its armour and guns, but the war had broken out before the upgrade could have happened. Only three of its over 1,000 crew could be rescued. The Bismarck was damaged and had to return to the city of Brest, dogged all the way by British warships. A swordfish biplane torpedo then, then hit its rudder as it attempted to limp home, halting it. It's then hammered by British battleships before being sunk by a torpedo from the cruiser Dorsetshire, but the Eugen escaped to Brest. Never again would a German capital ship enter the North Atlantic. Meanwhile, in the Mediterranean, for the British, the situation was improving. As German aircraft had been sent to Greece and Crete, they'd stopped attacking Malta. Forces on Malta started to savage German convoys going to Libya, and aircraft from Malta bombed the port of Tripoli and Benghazi. But before we break for a comfort break, Let's complete the picture by looking at the British home front. On the first week of May, Liverpool was repeatedly bombed, as was Belfast, Clydeside, Hull, Portsmouth and Cardiff. From the 10th to 11th of May, 571 bombers hit London, killing 1,400 civilians. But by the third week of May, the bombers were withdrawn from bombing Britain to prepare for the invasion of Russia. By now, most of fighter command have Spitfires, well, in the Middle East, the British were still using Hurricane, Blenheim, and US-made Tomahawks, but they're all better than anything the Italians have, but outclassed by the Germans, but they are at least easy to maintain in desert conditions. <coughs> Increasingly, the RAF from Britain were taking the fight to the Germans, conducting fighter sweeps over France. If there were over 100 planes, they're called circuses. Less, they're called rhubarbs. But these were an inefficient use of planes, and wore the British down as much as the Germans. But the Blitz had failed to break the British. 14,000 civilians had died, but British war production had never been higher. It cost Germany 600 bombers and had also taught Britain what worked for aerial bombing. The British now knew it would need more bombers and bigger bombers than Germany had for an, to win an air offensive. And as Germany turned on Russia, the British were determined to build such a force. I'm going to break now for five minutes, so I will recommence by my watch at 10 minutes 
past eight for the second half of the talk of the fighting of 1941. Thank you very much. So on the eve of Barbarossa, the Germans have 200 divisions, but they're desperately short of vehicles. Now of these 200 divisions, only 21 are Panzer divisions and 13 are motorized. And not all of the 200 divisions, of course, are available to invade Russia. Germany starts to defend Germany, to occupy France, the Low Countries, Norway, the Balkans. Greece would be occupied by the Italians. Only 17 Panzer divisions were available to evade the USSR. Only seven more than were used against France. But as it happens, now the Panzer divisions are only about two thirds the size of those Panzer divisions that invaded France. So they've got roughly the same number of tanks to invade Russia as they used against the French. The plan called for overwhelming force at key points and to maintain the speed of operations. This only could be maintained within three to 500 miles of the border. Holder oversaw the plan and had to assume the Red Army would be crushed close to the borders. Beyond 300 miles, the Germans would be dependent on a complex system of depots and motor pools, which of course requires a lot of trucks. Holter believed the Red Army had 170 divisions to face them. In actuality, instead of 170 divisions, the Russians had 303 divisions. Now to maintain speed, they would need plenty of motor transports, but this is in short supply and being steadily drained away to Libya to supply Rommel. The plan was to reach the Soviet oil supplies beyond Rostov at Baku, plunder it intact, and then to build a pipeline back to the Reich. Germany is already desperately short of fuel, trucks, spares, and manpower. Germany had 7.3 million men under arms. There are simply no more men to call up. German industry is also woefully inefficient, made worse by British bombing. The Germans have 3,000 tanks, but only 1,600 are the modern Panzer Fries and Fours. The rest are captured French, Czech, or obsolete designs, and they're desperately short of food at home after a poor harvest in 1940. Now, most of Germany's conquered territories have been dependent on overseas food imports, like, for example, Norway. Norway needed 57% of its food to be imported, and they're all desperately struggling under a British, bar, uh, bomb, uh, British blockade. Operation Barbarossa had to solve the food crisis by seizing the Ukraine, even though the German army knew this would cause famine in Soviet cities. Holder's main aim, however, was to be Moscow. Now they have 3 million men, 3,000 tanks, 7,000 artillery pieces, although in fact this is fewer than they would used to invade France. They had 2,252 planes, which is also 250 planes less than they would used to invade France, and near 700 planes less than they had lost over Britain. And they also have 6,000 motor vehicles, but only 64 out of their 121 divisions are fully trained. Most of their army is half trained at best. Now against France, they'd had 91 divisions on a 600 mile border, aiming to advance 150 miles. Against the Russians, they have 121 divisions on a 1,300 mile border, but they have to punch, they think, three to 500 miles, and that won't bring them to Moscow. But the Red Army was weakened. In the 1930s, the Stalinist purges had killed three out of five marshals of the Soviet Union, including the genius, and I don't use the word lightly, the genius Tukhachevsky. It also involved the death of 50 out of 57 corps commanders and 154 out of 186 divisional commanders. And their armoured units built by Tukhachevsky. Tukhachevsky had created armoured units, paratroop units, mechanised units. All of these have been broken up as they were loyal to him and not to Stalin. The Red Army had already really struggled in its war against Finland and the Finns would be joining in the attack on Russia as they were eager for revenge. They'd also be joined by 97,000 German mountain troops from Norway. The attack was to begin with 800 Brandenburgers, they're Germans that can speak Russian using captured Russian uniforms, operating behind, behind the Russian lines to blow up power stations and cut telephone lines up to 30 miles behind the, the Russian lines. Stalin rejected all signs of an imminent attack, 
refusing to believe that anybody could betray him before he could betray them. In the first two weeks, overwhelming force at key points and tactical surprise enabled rapid German gains. Von Lieb's Army Group North overran the Baltic states, while Army Group Center under Von Bock went through Poland and encircled a huge force around Bielistok. Army Group South under Von Rundstedt faced stiffer resistance, but still advanced. In two weeks, the Red Army lost 6,857 planes, mostly on the ground, and were on average losing three divisions a day. In those two weeks, they suffered 589 1,537 casualties. Many Germans believed that those first two weeks had won the war. By the end of July, the German advance was unstoppable. Guderian took Smolensk before pushing south, while forces under Horst looked to encircle three whole Soviet armies. Now you might say, how much is that? To put it into context, if you'd have scraped together the entire army of the British Empire, we had less than one army group but three whole Soviet army groups are encircled by Horst. Further north, German forces were advancing on Leningrad, but Soviet forces were starting to coalesce and counterattack, and critically, Hitler was starting to interfere with the German army. On the 19th of July, Hitler insists that Leningrad in the north and the Ukraine in the south are the priority, not Moscow. As soon as the Smolensk pocket was destroyed, he ordered Army Group Center to hand over its tanks two whole panzer groups to drive south. Moscow, he said, would not be taken, but would instead be destroyed from the air by the Luftwaffe. Given their failure in the skies over Britain, this is not promising. Moscow, as it happens, will never be attacked by a massed air raid. On the 23rd of July, Hiller orders the Luftwaffe to support the advance of the Finns to stop an entirely fictitious British landing in Northern Norway. There's no way we're gonna land troops in Northern Norway but German aircraft are diverted to do so in the Arctic. And also he adds further objectives in the South. He interferes again in the 30th of July and the 20th on the 12th of August, worried about his flanks and the slowing of the advance. But the Germans had by now reached the limits of their oil supply lines and their vehicles were starting to break down. The Smolensk pocket was destroyed, but its effort pushed the German army to its limits. After that, the Germans are forced to dig in and weather Soviet counterattacks by 17 whole Soviet armies, as the USSR had called up an additional 5 million men. Now, despite Britain badly needing war supplies themselves, they agreed to send more and more equipment to help the Russians. The USA also sends Harry Hopkins to see, to see Stalin, to ask Stalin what he needs. Now, to the delight of the Americans, Stalin asks for machine parts and aluminium to make aircraft. They are delighted because this shows that the Russians are planning for a long war. A country planning a short war asks for aircraft. A country planning for a long war asks for machines to make up aircraft and the raw materials to do so. And that's precisely what Stalin's asking for. Meanwhile, in the Middle East, concern had grown over Vichy French Syria. Now, there are 30,000 French soldiers loyal to the Vichy government with 90 tanks and nearly 300 planes in Syria. General de Gaulle, leader of the Free French, is sent to Egypt, where there are 6,000 Free French soldiers. The British are worried that the Germans are going to use Syria under Vichy French control as a base to invade Egypt. On the 14th of May, Churchill approved a joint Anglo-French invasion of Syria. Wavell, however, is reluctant. Wavell is desperate to beat Rommel in Libya. He says, concentrate on Libya first, then we can invade Syria. But he's overruled, and so Operation Exporter, the invasion of Syria, is on, on the 8th of June. Wavell, however, was also told to attack Rommel at the same time, known as Operation Battleaxe, to relieve Tobruk on the 15th of June. Battleaxe should have been delayed till after the invasion of Syria but Churchill wouldn't listen to Wavell. Worse, the 7th Armoured Division in Libya had just been given new improved Crusader tanks. Great, you think, new improved tanks, but they were given no time to train on these new vehicles, and they did need more training time. Syria was to be invaded by a mixed force of tanks, Australians, Indians, and free French soldiers, but French resistance was fierce. It is often forgotten by the French that in the Second World War, 
the French lost more men fighting against the British than they did against the Germans. Indeed, the French fought bitterly against the British in the Second World War, but it's not covered in the French education system. The French army in Syria in particular hated the British. Some of these French officers in Syria, after the end of the Second World War, plotted to kill our current queen, Queen Elizabeth II, when she was just Princess Elizabeth, and was visiting Paris for the armistice celebrations. They also planned in 1946 to attack London with cholera. These are the kind of people that were in Syria, or the French. And so French resistance is fierce. It took five days to cross the river line. Then the Australians had to call for reinforcements, further weakening the British army launching Operation Battle Axe. Fighting would continue until the 14th of July. The French would suffer around 7,000 casualties and lose 180 aircraft for a Commonwealth loss of around 4,500 casualties. But Syria was occupied and the Middle Eastern oil was safeguarded for the British war effort. But it had, it had fatally weakened Operation Battle Axe at a critical time. In Libya, Operation Battle Axe had begun on the 15th of June. The British and Germans were about evenly matched. Now, to win on an attack, you should outnumber your opponents three to one. But British and German forces had a similar number of tanks, men, and guns. Now, that's okay against the Italian army, but it's not okay against the Germans. The plan was that the 4th Indian Division would attack the Germans along the coast head on, while the 7th Armoured took the flanks. The plan was too ambitious. The British forces had been weakened too much by the invasion of Syria. After three days of heavy fighting, the British had lost half of their 200 tanks and had to pull back. The Germans had only lost around 50 tanks. The British then, however, narrowly avoided disaster on the third day. The Germans attempted to encircle them before fierce British counterattacks drove them back. Overall, the British suffered around 1,000 casualties, the Germans around 1,400 casualties, and the stalemate returned to Libya. On the 21st of June, Churchill, disappointed in the failure of battle acts that he himself had largely called, caused, sacked Wavell as CNC Middle East and moved him to be CNC of India, and then moved the CNC of India, Orkenbeck, to take command of the fighting in the Middle East. Wavell had done well, but Churchill didn't trust him. And as Wavell himself said, maybe it's time for a change in the bowling, as I have had a few sixes knocked off me recently. Wavell, by the way, would then have a difficult war, having faced the early Mediterranean war, where he had almost no soldiers to defend the Middle East, being attacked by the Germans. He was then sent out to command the Pacific, where he would have almost no soldiers to try and defend against the surprise Japanese attack. He had a tough war. In the critical battle of the Atlantic, however, Hiller also kept interfering. Now, eight U-boats were withdrawn from the Atlantic to help with Barbarossa, but it wasn't really clear what they were going to do. The invasion of Russia, after all, is a land battle. There's not much room for submarines in that kind of battle. Four were also withdrawn to act as weather spotters for the Luftwaffe, and six sent to the Arctic to stop the British landing in northern Norway and the Arctic Circle. All of these should have been used to hunt British convoys. It's a complete waste of the U-boat force. At this time, there are no British convoys in that area, but a surprisingly large number of German submarines. Worse for the German submarines, the refit and repair of U-boats was halted while they repaired the battle cruisers Scharnhorst and Neisenau. Dernitz, the commander of the U-boat force, is absolutely furious. British Bomber Command is also launching frequent bombing raids on Germany, but only about one bomber in five is actually get able to get within five miles of their target. Now think about that. If a bomb is dropped five miles away, it's not going to do any damage, but only one in five are able to get even that close. On a cloudy night, it's worse, with only one in 15 bombers able to get within five miles, but the British are doing what they can to help the Russians. On the 12th of July, Britain and Russia signed a mutual assistance pact. It's just a shame they hadn't done so in 1939, or indeed in 1938, if you'd have listened to the, the talk two years ago. On the 9th of August, Churchill and Roosevelt met aboard the battleship Prince of Wales. They agreed to concentrate on Germany before Japan, that's despite the fact that neither America nor Japan are involved in the war, they're already planning on that war, and the US Army starts to prepare for war with Germany. The US Navy was already busy fighting the Germans in the Atlantic. 
The RAF continue to bomb Germany every night, and the Scharnhorst and Neisenau in Brest Harbour is also, are also hit. Now, by the summer of 1941, the Luftwaffe is in real crisis. Production had not kept pace with demand, and aircraft design was in meltdown. Now, the ME110 was poor in air-to-air -air combat. The ME109, their version of the Spitfire, was unforgiving to fly and lethal to new pilots. The JU-88 was barely better than the pre-war bombers, but all had been designed before 1936, so they're five-year-old designs and they show it. Designs of new planes took time and corners were being cut. The ME-210 on the left was meant to be an upgraded version of the 110, but instead Messerschmitt redesigned the entire aircraft top to bottom and then issued it to the pilots without trials. It's simply not fit for purpose. It barely flies and is likely to go into a highly lethal spin. A number of German fighter races are killed trying to work out how to fly this damn thing. The only ray of hope for the Germans is the Fokker Wolf 190. Speer, a man who I still can't believe escapes being killed as a war criminal, he's Hitler's chief architect, but he did have the gift of the gap and it did appear in a lot of British documentaries been interviewed. It's amazing how far that gets you, so he did survive the war. Speer was, being give, was given the task of making three massive new factories to build aircraft to help the German war effort. It was expected that these would take nine months to get up and running. There are still 40 new designs being worked on, 14 by Messerschmitt alone, but little work is going on to improve, uh, improve the existing designs for immediate production. The Luftwaffe wasn't going to grow anytime soon, and there's a desperate shortage of badly needed air transports. After losing 250 JU-52s over Crete, and they only had 150 available to supply troops in Russia. As Germany struggles to supply their forces, the British and the Soviets deepen their links for supply. On the 17th of August, Britain and Russia agreed to, uh, to ship more and more equipment to the Russian front. However, the Germans are increasingly running low on supplies, and the British and the USSR give an ultimatum to Persia. Modern day Iran, Britain and Russia get, get together and they tell modern day Iran, then called Persia, that they had to expel the German army officers that worked for their government. The Persian government refused. On the 25th of August, the British and the Russians invaded Iran, Russia from the north and Britain from the south. And I do love the picture to the right. What you have there are some, some Russian communist soldiers on horseback and some very highly aristocratic British soldiers in a light tank with pith helmets. All those British regiments are highly aristocratic. God knows what the communists made of our upper classes meeting in the middle of Iran. But Britain, invade, Britain and Russia invaded on the 25th of August. By mid-September, Tehran had fallen. The Middle East and East Africa are now secure for the British, and the British can finally concentrate on the fighting in Libya. British and US supplies would flow to Russia through Persia. It has to be said, the only reason why we invaded that country was to build a dirty Great Big Road and Railway so that we could land war supplies on the Persian Gulf and send it to Russia. But needs must. As Barbarossa had the gun, British fighter command had also stepped up pressure on the Luftwaffe, conducting over 8,000 sorties over France by the end of June and more in the following month. 123 British fighters were lost for 81 German. It simply couldn't be justified. Great British pilots like Bader were being lost and the Mediterranean badly needed British aircraft, as by the way did the British Far East. My grandfather fought in Singapore, and they could have really have done with some of those Spitfires out there to stop the Japanese. Fighter squadrons were being wasted at home, but it was slowly bleeding away German air strength. And the German, for the Germans, on the other hand, continued to bleed us in the battle for the Atlantic. 43 ships were sunk in July, 41 in August, 83 in September. But you may remember from the first half of the talk that at the start of this talk, the Germans were sinking ships into the hundreds every month. Now they're achieving scores in the 40s. It's never high enough to starve the British out, who already have 200 aircraft on anti-submarine duty, guided by Ultra. No U-boats could operate within range of these aircraft. On the 21st of August, the first British convoy to help the Russians set sail. British forces have done a good, British farmers have done a good job 
of reducing the need for food imports, making sure that Britain was less dependent on convoys coming in to keep us in the war effort. Our arable land had grown from 11 million to 15 and a half million square miles. British farming was also increasingly mechanized in what was a new agricultural revolution. The 1941 harvest broke records for both acreage and yield per acre, despite using ever more marginal land due to improved seeding and fertilizer. British civilians were getting ever better rations, but in Germany, rations were being cut every month. The German U-boat campaign, so they believed, had to sink 1 million tons of shipping per month. So far in the entire war, the Germans had only achieved half of that three times. They'd only gone above 600,000 tons when they're aiming for a million once in the entire war. As it happens, even if they'd have achieved that million tons a month, it still wouldn't have been enough to starve Britain out. But the submarine campaign had its own risks. On the screen, you should see the American destroyer, the USS Reuben James. Now, on the 31st of October, eight German submarines operating off South Greenland attacked a British convoy of 44 merchant ships guarded by five American destroyers. And they sank the American destroyer, the Reuben James, thinking it was a British ship. Now, in the defense of the Germans, the Americans had given 50 identical ships to the British. And the Reuben James was shooting at the Germans, and the Germans shot back thinking they were British, sunk them, and killed them. But according to the American public, it was okay for the Americans to shoot at the Germans. It was not okay for the Germans to shoot at the Americans because Germany and America were at peace. So only the Americans should have the right to shoot. The Reuben James is sunk, killing 115 US sailors. The British publicized this loss across the radio waves and in every newspaper they can buy adverts. And the American public are shocked and outraged at these American deaths, pushing the Americans ever closer to war. Meanwhile, Germany's main ally, Italy, is struggling badly. At the end of July 1941, Italy had sent their first division to fight against the Russians, despite the fact the Germans told them not to. The Germans said they simply didn't want the help of the Italian army. The Italians feel humiliated. Now, when the Germans planned to invade Russia, the Germans told Finland, Hungary, Romania, and Bulgaria, but they failed to tell the Italians, their main ally. Mussolini felt humiliated. Italy was being bombed flat by the RAF. Naples had been blitzed in early July, destroying 6,000 tons of precious oil. The Italian bread ration had been cut to just 200 grams of bread a day. In Italian occupied Greece, they could only give them 90 grams a day. In the second week of October, the Italian ration was cut still further. The Italians are starving and now they're being looked down upon by their own allies. Submarine operations out of Malta were devastating Italian supplies going to North Africa in the Libyan front. In the first week of October, only 20% of supplies earmarked for Libya were actually sent due to a shortage of Italian ships and only half the men that were meant to go. And eventually the Germans lost patience and sent the German Field Marshal Kesselring to take over command of the Mediterranean. The Italians, utterly humiliated, now found themselves to be nothing more than puppets of their German masters. Malta was no longer being bombed, had been, had been turned by the British into a vast airbase for heavy bombers and an invaluable naval base. Two British submarines, the Upholder and the Urge, sank two irreplaceable large troop transports that the Italians simply could no longer build. Meanwhile, on the 9th of November, a British cruiser force, Force K, managed to sally out and find the first Italian convoy sent to Libya in a month. Such had been Italian ship losses that for a month they hadn't dared send any ships out. After a month, they tried to sneak some out and it ran smack bang into Force K. All of it was destroyed. All 10 Italian merchant ships, all three destroyers sunk for no loss to the British. The Libyan front was being starved of resources. But returning to Russia, in September, Guderian, after taking Smolensk, had been ordered by Hitler to turn away from Moscow and drive south. Some four whole Soviet armies were encircled around Kiev, and 675,000 sold, uh, Soviet soldiers were captured. You can see the pictures, their entire hillsides covered in captured prisoners. It's an amazing triumph. 
But Holder, architect of Barbarossa, was in despair. He wanted to take Moscow, force the Soviet government to flee, and hope that the Soviet Union collapsed. Hitler, however, is chasing economic targets, not victory. He wanted Army Group North and South to halt, while Army Group South pushed for Moscow, but Hitler disagrees with Holder. Now, Holder's plan may not have worked anyway. On the 24th of June, Stalin had already started to evacuate Soviet industry to the Ural Mountains out of German reach, 600 miles to the east of Moscow. He had also already ordered the evacuation of the government. Stalin was prepared to lose Moscow and fight on. The Kiev victory did not change the fact that Russia was too vast for the Wehrmacht to cope with, and the Red Army reserves were seemingly inexhaustible. After Kiev, Hitler finally agrees to push for Moscow. It took time, however, to redirect forces around Kiev, and it's a logistical nightmare. But by the 30th of September, Typhoon, the attack on Moscow, was ready. It had already begun to rain heavily. At first, Typhoon again was stunningly successful, with another six Soviet armies captured in two enormous pockets. Three quarters of a million Russian soldiers are taken prisoner. And the, but then the rain starts to turn the ground to mud, slowing the German advance. After three and a half months of fighting, the Germans have taken over two million Russian prisoners, but they're now crawling through the mud, short of fuel, and many of their frontline units are down to below half strength. In October, things got worse for the Germans. Large numbers of motor vehicles were now breaking down under the strain of three and a half months of driving off-road through mud, and Zhukov, the Russian elite commander had arrived from the Japanese border to defend Moscow, along with his veteran troops, fresh from their fighting around Kalkin Gol in 1938. Veteran Soviet troops under an experienced general. More and more men are arriving to defend Moscow from the Germans. But in Libya, Orkinlek wanted, as Wavell had wanted before, to build up British strength before fighting Rommel. There would be no more half measures like there had been in battle acts. He reorganized his forces. Now, he created the Eighth Army. You'll have heard of the British Eighth Army, and you might have wondered why it's called the Eighth Army. While the old 1940 French armies have been numbered one to seven, so to avoid confusion, our army in the desert was called the Eighth Army. Not that the French army was still fighting against the Germans, but with traditionalists at heart. The British troops in Palestine were called the Ninth Army. The British troops in Iraq, the Tenth Army. People like my grandfather out in, uh, out in the east, the 14th Army. The Lieutenant General Cunningham, victor of the fighting in East Africa, was sent to command this new 8th Army. And from July to October, Orkinlek built up British strength, receiving 300 new cruiser tanks. He also received 300 new US built Stuart light tanks and 170 infantry track tanks, along with 34,000 trucks, 600 field guns, 140 anti aircraft guns, 200 anti air anti tank guns and 900 mortars. Our commando unit, the Long Range Desert Group, or LRDG, was also considerably expanded, with men taken from across the empire, used to desert conditions and independent action. They were used for reconnaissance and sabotage actions and are a real blessing for the British Army. Also in the late summer of 1941, the SAS are formed. The offensive would begin in November, and it would be called Crusader. But back in Russia, Army Group North is still pushing on Leningrad. By the 8th of September, they were within 10 miles of the city and had crossed the Neva River. The second city of the Soviet Union was nearly surrounded, now only reachable by the Russians across a frozen lake. But taking the city would cause problems for the Germans, especially how to feed it. Hitler decided not to capture the city, but to instead destroy it through hunger and bombardment. The rest of the survivors would then be allowed to walk back to the Soviet Union when German troops broke in in the spring. The plan was that the Germans would level the city to the ground and then hand over the rubble of one of the great world cities over to Finland. As the Germans advanced, they had destroyed army group after army group, but too many Soviet soldiers had escaped in skirt encirclement to escape back to either the Russian lines or to join the Russian partisans. And as the Germans reached Moscow, the gaps between their attacks increasingly lengthened as it took more and more time to bring up supplies of fuel and ammunition. Russian resistance was also stiffening. 
The Germans crossed the Moscow-Volga Canal, but as they crossed that canal, the rain turned to snow and the Germans lack winter clothing. At the start of Barbarossa, Milk, second in command of Goering in the Luftwaffe, had ordered fur boots and woolen underwear for his staff. He'd be the only senior German commander to do so. The German boots, for example, have iron nails that just conduct the cold from the snow right up into the foot. The Germans were facing furious counterattacks by ski equipped Soviet units in white winter camouflage, and the German units are simply being ground down. The 24th Motorized Corps, for example, was pushing on the key railway junction of Tula just before Moscow, but it's down to 10% strength. So, in other words, nine out of 10 of them are already casualties before the German army tell them to capture Tula. It was also the coldest earliest winter of the 20th century. As it happens, Guderian trying to capture Tula says he can probably take Tula. Surprisingly, that, uh, that unit that's lost nine out of 10 of all men still attacks, but after that they can go no further. Engines, guns, and even the grease on the shells freeze, while Russian equipment had been designed for the cold. Further south, Army Group South had occupied Kharkov and overrun the Crimean Peninsula and Sevastopol was besieged. In November, Rostov, gateway to the Russian oil of the Caucasus fell. But before Moscow, Zhukov had 80 divisions, 1.25 million men, 7,600 guns, and 990 tanks. About a third of these tanks were actually British-made tanks. Now, my grandfather would have loved to have seen 50 of these sent to Singapore, and if so, would have probably have saved Singapore from the Japanese. But the British recognized that the key battle is Moscow, and so they sacrificed parts of their own empire, unknowingly to them, to send some 300 tanks to help the Russians in the battle for Moscow. The Germans are still grinding forwards, but slowly and at a terrible cost. They get to within 30 miles of Moscow, but the Red Army is still unbeaten. Soviet industry had largely escaped. Some 2,593 factories had been moved east, along with 40% of their workers on 1.5 million railway wagons. The British had also sent the Russians 2,000 tanks and 1,800 Hurricane aircraft, all badly needed in the Mediterranean and to defend the Far East, but also needed in the crucial battles in Russia. On the 2nd of December, Army Group Centre and North reported that the troops could no longer carry on. They were too hungry, cold, and few in number. In the desert, there were three German divisions and two Italian corps, based in two British mechanised corps. The Germans had 121 planes, the Italians 192, the British 554. On the 18th of November, Operation Crusader was launched. In the lead up, the RAF conducted 3,000 sorties, destroying 70 Axis planes, and the SAS launched their first raid on the 16th, although it proved to be a disaster after they powered up during a thunderstorm. A commander raid attacked Rommel's headquarters in what is like a boy's own heroics raid. They attacked Rommel's headquarters and attempted to kill Rommel and all of his staff. And they did indeed attack the headquarters and kill everyone there. But unbeknownst to them, Rommel was away in Rome on holiday at that time. Crusader took the Axis completely by surprise. On the second day was the largest tank battle so far in the North African campaign. The British tanks took the Germans by complete surprise by charging across the desert at the cavalry of old. But the British tanks were eventually halted at Sidi Rezeg by the German anti-tank units. Rommel counterattacked, trying to encircle the 8th Army. Cunningham wanted to withdraw, but Auchinleck refused and sacked him in the middle of the battle to replace him with Neil Ritchie. It's a terrible choice as the fighting is still ongoing and Ritchie is far away in Egypt. But Rommel was soon halted due to the actions of the, the Desert Air Force and forced to withdraw. Meanwhile, the British 13th Corps had reached the brook. Rommel counterattacked again, but failed to renew the siege. The Germans were increasingly bitter towards the Italians, who were reluctant to attack. The Italians were increasingly bitter towards the Germans for nicking their stuff. On the 7th of December, one last German effort to drive the British back failed. Tobruk had been relieved. After three weeks of fighting, Rommel started to fall back the Gazala line. The Desert War was small, <coughs> but not unimportant. 
the fully mechanized German Africa Corps would have been worth its weight in gold on the Eastern Front. After all, it was these, it were these troops that had won the battle in France in 1940. And as Hitler con uh, considered the Mediterranean theater vital, he had diverted far too many resources to fight in North Africa, unlike the British, who never considered the Mediterranean front vital. He had taken six submarines, for example, out of the Atlantic to the Mediterranean to try and halt Crusader, and were drawn more to the North Sea to guard against the invasion of Norway. It left not a single U-boat in the key theater of the Atlantic, except for around Gibraltar. At home, German workers were only getting around 1,500 calories a day, nowhere near enough. Fuel was so short that the newly repaired German surface fleet could not put to sea, and stocks of coal were almost out. Steel production was falling rapidly, and the planned expansion of the Luftwaffe with those three new factories was scrapped. The German Empire could now offer the Germans nothing. French factories could not work without coal and oil, and its workers had been conscripted and sent as slave labour to Germany. On the 3rd of December, Hitler signed an order to reduce the crazy over-engineering of German uniforms and equipment. The German machine gun, for example, took three times as many months as the British model to build. The MG42, for example, had nine unnecessary inspection stamps on each machine gun, and it came in a velvet-lined wooden box. This is completely unnecessary work wasting the time of the German war effort. From the 4th to the 5th of December, on the Eastern Front, temperatures reached minus 35 degrees C. Machine gun lubricant froze and the Soviet counteroffensive began. <laughs>